Martina Valmasoy, welcome to the podcast. Nice to see you. Nice to see you, Dylan. It's nice to be here and finally talk this year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've been trying to schedule this for like three weeks now, and there's been some complications, which maybe we should start with that. Why don't you uh, explain how you're doing? And as we were setting up this podcast, you then you know, sort of went silent in our email exchange and then posted that you had had a fairly scary accident while out climbing in the mountains near your home in Italy. So tell us what happened yeah. and what you're doing. Yeah, well, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it has been a bit unfortunate and fortunate, I would say. Uh, of course, I was not lucky because I got um, into this uh, accident while climbing and it was a long time since I wasn't climbing, you know, uh, probably was my second climbing route in four years and uh, the second in three days. So I was really, I was just starting to, to, to do that again. And, and uh, well, I went to a really popular place in uh, Arco, um, close to Lake Garda. And uh, well, you know, just like at the end of the route, um, a huge uh, block, like a huge uh, stone, like um, fell down, fell on me basically. And uh, I was lucky enough to be to be looking up, and so I saw it coming, and so I was able to to move as much as I could. But of course, I was belaying, so I could not move much and uh, anyway I protected my head at least and my chest but the one of the big um, rocks just hit me on the hip and uh, so yes I broke my uh, iliac crest yeah uh, I yeah so luckily it's a composed fracture even though there's few crack on it mm-hmm. and uh, so yeah like um I'm I'm happy because I really I could have it could have been really really much worse, and so yeah, just now it just needs some patience and um, try to stay quiet, even though because now the pain it's uh it's okay and so I can I can move a little bit in in my apartment with crunches and it's it's hard to be just staying on the couch you know i always yeah. try to move a little bit and then i move stuff and and then my mom complains because i get tired and, and i move <laughs> more than what i should but um yeah you know it's difficult for us to stay still you know yeah but uh it's okay it's go- it's just gonna be it's a break you know it's, uh, sometimes it happens what is the recovery it's a bit look of like? a shame well, I don't really like until now they haven't been able to tell me much. Uh they just say that uh, yeah, for this month for the first 5 weeks I I really need to chill and just just like try because as I did not I didn't need uh, an operation. I didn't need surgery. Yeah. Um so I just need to 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 relax and rest yeah. um to heal the fracture. And then, uh, so in three weeks, I will know, hopefully the, the, the fracture will be like, hopefully good. And I could try to start do some probably swimming, yeah. <laughs> which I hate, <laughs> but <laughs> it's, it's going to be interesting. Yeah. Yes. Well, but uh, yeah, well, let's see. Yeah. Well, thank goodness you're okay. I know that was probably yeah. a pretty scary incident and a tough way to yeah. end what has been a really awesome season for you. And I'm excited to talk all about all the interesting things that you've yes. got going on and that you were tackling this summer. But actually, while we're on the subject, it reminds me that in one of the first episodes I ever recorded, it was with Hillary Allen and she recounted yes. the story of her near death accident in the mountains where she fell yeah i was there probably I probably know. you don't know, have to come to with me in the mountains no no i'm kidding no, but <laughs> now, now that we're t- we're sort of starting here i'd love to yeah. allow you to recount that incident i actually i was texting with hillary to make sure it was okay that you and i talked about okay. this but um she, you know, of course, was, uh, you know, racing in Tromso, the Tromso Sky Race and had 
what was a really scary near death accident fall uh, from the high point. Yeah. Of and from what I understand, you were really involved in the rescue. So maybe tell us a little bit about that story and how that impacted you. Yeah, well, that was really, really scary. Um, yeah, I, I knew Hillary before. I mean, and um, I was there um, as a photographer. Um, and so, yeah, we always go um, up to the ridge of Hamperoken. And we were going back. I was I was with Ian Corliss, um, the photographer from Skyrunning. He used to shoot Skyrunning. Well, you know him. <laughs> yep. Um, and uh, well, we were just like uh, going back, and uh, we we were stopping um, to get some shots. And I saw Hillary coming, and so we stopped, and uh, we cheered each other, "Hey, hi!" And and you know, it was everything came like s happened so quickly that I well, it's super clear in my mind. <laughs> it's just that. Uh, how she fell, uh, we didn't see because um, um, she was coming right behind a, a rock. The ridge was going a little bit back and forth, and so she was hiding in the moment she fell. Mm. So I, I, but I saw her coming out. So okay. she was already dropping out from the mountain when I saw her, uh. and I saw her bouncing multiple times. And uh, yeah, I mean, you know, you freeze for a second and uh, the fall was really, really bad. Um, you really could tell, like, I, I, I honestly thought she was gone because I, I saw how she fell. And, um, and then luckily I heard her screaming, mm. <laughs> you know, it's not, it's like, okay, she's hurting, but she's alive. Yeah. So as soon as I, well, as soon as she stopped, I started to run uh, down. Um, and uh, so, well, try to find a safe spot to run down because it's not a, an easy terrain. Uh, <laughs> right. But uh, somehow I arrived down, um, I arrived to her um, just after um, Manu, uh, this guy that lived in Trump, so he was just behind her with her, so for him it was easier faster to go to reach her. So I arrived just after him, and uh, well, luckily I had uh, I always I well not always, but I often try to carry, you know, even if I'm working, uh, survival blankets and something uh, mm -hmm. just in case uh, because you never know. And so luckily I had a survival blanket and, uh, well, of course, um, Hunter Rocken is a never good, it's never good weather in this race. Um, at least that day we were lucky enough that, uh, the helicopter could fly because I, I raced that race, uh, other times and, and definitely, um, the, the race I did it, it was not possible to, to let the helicopter fly for sure. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, before to go down, actually, right when I was going down, I uh, called Kilian, and he was uh, at the top of uh, Amperoken, at the ridge, top of the, the ridge. We managed to uh, um, call the rescue and everything. Well, I called Kilian, Kilian right away called the, called the rescue. And then um, after there was also Ian that came down and well, basically we were holding uh, Hillary um, uh, until the, the rescue came. And so, yeah, wow. well, basically that's it. But um, yeah, it was pretty scary. Um, she was always conscious, which is good. Um, and so she was like in the bad luck. Uh, she was really lucky that she did not she did not hit her head yeah at all at all so it is the first thing we checked because uh and uh, at least um this is something because really she bounced few, multiple times so yeah. yeah well i'm sure it was a fairly traumatizing and scary thing for you to be a part of yeah. but, you know thank goodness that hillary is okay and back competing at the highest level in the sport and 
I think now with you recovering from your own rock fall incident while you're climbing, yeah. it's a good reminder for our listeners to just be safe when you're in the mountains and do everything you can yeah. to mitigate. Yeah, all well, and, and sometimes just be prepared because, you know, even if you don't do anything wrong, something can happen. The mountains yeah. are the mountains. You can't control it. And, uh, and you have to accept it somehow. I mean, there's no reason for me to be angry at the mountain, you know. Uh, it's a bit unfortunate, you know, it's a, it's a, for me, it's a route that like there's millions of people going up there yeah. every year. We had four teams ahead of us. They uh -huh. all passed through there and I was the only one. <laughs> that got, yeah. But yeah, you know, it's just like sometimes it has Random. to happen. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Well, it's, I think maybe a, uh, you know, if kind of a powerful and, uh, I don't know, uncomfortable place to start just talking about falling in the mountains and these like big injuries. <laughs> mountains that, are great. Yeah, mountains exactly. are great. I'm yeah. still looking forward to going to mountains. That's the final <laughs> yeah. so, thing to say. Anyway, it's a, a good place to start, but you know, I think a, a lot of people are going to want to get to know you personally. And I think this is a great opportunity to do so as a longtime follower and admirer of yours. I really am interested to hear you talk about the career you've carved out for yourself in the sport and hear about your recent victory at TDS and your personal Giro, Giro d'Italia, your bike <laughs> adventure this summer. So we have a lot to get to, but I think just first, the best place to start is just to introduce yourself as we were getting started here. I explained that we've got an international audience, but certainly most people are North American based. And I'm yeah. sure there's a lot of people listening who follow you on social media, but who don't know as much about your story. So tell us a little bit about your background, your history with sport, your Italian heritage and things like that. <laughs> so, yes. Uh um, I'm born and raised in the Dolomites, so and I'm back home now uh, since five years. And um, yeah, I I grew up as um, doing sports uh, because my parents were really really passionate about multiple sports, Nordic skiing. Fly, they were flying, they were sailing, they were like really really active in the mountains, climbers. And uh, so since I was really, really young, I started uh, doing sports. I started uh, to, to do mainly um, Nordic skiing. And then, of course, uh, when you are a Nordic skier, you train uh, in summer, you go hiking, you go running. And um, so I, I was really, I was fortunate to have, um, uh, like I grew up in the mountains and I lived in a place surrounded by mountains. So that's really like um, where I feel good. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so um, until I, I was a teen, I competed in Nordic skiing. Um, I was not good, I think. <laughs> or, you know, there's so much about gear and gear preparation in Nordic ski that can be really frustrating. And sometimes uh, even if you train hard, uh, you don't get the, the great, the fast skis or... So it was a bit, uh, it was a little bit too much to handle for me um, when I was a teen. And, and then my mom was doing uh, some ski mountaineering races, more uphill races. And uh, so she got into, yeah, she got me into ski mountaineering. First races were horrible because I was really, really good in the, in the climbing and like in the uphills um, as an Nordic skier. But it took me, like, I was taking longer to go down, <laughs> to get down the mountains rather than going up. So, but still, I, yeah, it was, it was hilarious. Sometimes I was crying uh, under a trees and just like, oh, I could not finish this race. I need to call the rescue. <laughs> also because, like, the, the races we were doing as a young, when we were young, they, they were really, really tough. I mean, like senior races with really hard downhills with any kind of snow. And uh, me, I did not have the experience. Like I was not experienced. They saw like the potential, my potential. And then I, I competed um, um, uh, in the World Cup for um, like 10 years. And then I'm still competing, but just out of the World Cup now doing yeah. 
the races I want, uh, races of the Grand Course and, and so on. So, yes, I, I, I can tell I'm, I'm a stronger ski mountaineer, maybe. Uh, and then, of course, uh, as you do uh, winter sports, you still have to train in summer. And I always, I always run. I always um, hiked um, in summer. And, um, and uh, but I, I was basically, you know, just doing short distances for training. And I started to do something longer and get more into trail running since I started to work for Salomon as yep. a content creator. So, yeah. yeah. Well, great. Um, yeah. I mean, it's a good, good introduction and appreciate you giving us a little bit of the background. And there's a lot there that I want to touch on later on in our conversation. But I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about your mom and the inspiration that she's <laughs> given you as an athlete. Because, of course, I don't know her personally. I don't know anything about her. But as I was texting with Hillary yesterday, she also mentioned <laughs> that she's developed an interesting relationship with your mother and that she exemplifies that proud Italian hospitality yeah. when uh, Hillary has come to visit the Italian Dolomite. So maybe talk about your mom and how she's influenced and inspired you as an athlete. Well, my mom, I think at the end of the year, she has more elevation gain than I have. <laughs> <laughs> because yeah, I think so because I mean um well she's um uh, she's 63 but like she's every every day at 8 a.m she's already up the hill above my house which is 800 meter of elevation she's doing that every day on a regular basis she picked the the dog um of the bakery because now she doesn't have the dog anymore we used to have dogs it just died but Oh, yes. And yeah. so, yeah, but so she always have to, so if, even if she doesn't have a, a dog now, she go and pick a dog of someone else and then she go, <laughs> I just go out to walk the dog and then she go with 4,000 meters of elevation and then come back <laughs> and prepare coffee, you know? Yeah. And, um, and sometimes I feel like, oh man, I'm so lazy. My mom is already on top of the mountain, you know? And I'm like, I, I just having breakfast. <laughs> so sometimes it's frustrating. Yeah. Uh, she really cannot live without it. Um, she has to go out, even if it's a short uh, hike or if it's, um, yeah, yeah. Like she needs it, and um, it's what um, I think I got from her. I really got the the passion of the mount from the mountains. <laughs> so, you know, obviously, I want to get around to talking about your athletic career, but maybe before we do that, let's talk about your creative streak <laughs> and the career you've carved out for yourself as a photographer, content creator, and entrepreneur in the sport. Cause I think you've really done a great job of piecing together what seems to be a great lifestyle and a great profession for yourself. And I think it's something that a lot of young athletes could try and duplicate in their own career. And, uh, you know, I think sort of like supportive of your athletic career, you sort of have this freelancing role as a photographer. And I know you also own a business. So let's first like talk about the photography components and yes. I'd, I'd love to hear you talk about how you got into that how you developed that skill and how it's kind of supportive of this greater career that you've built for yourself in the sport so yes I I've always um I've always been passionate about art and art in general and um in high school I I have been in a I I did a uh, art school uh, when I was in high school, and then I haven't. Um, I didn't go to the university because I started working uh, right away, and also because I I really I was confused. I I didn't know which path I I wanted to take, and so I I say okay, I rather start working and um, bring home some money, and then uh, if I would like clear up my mind, then I would go to university because I I didn't like the idea of just because most of my friends were just starting the university because if you wait then you will never start but yeah. I was like no if you really want to start you will start at any age you know my mom uh, as, as went to the university when me and my sister were kids so you know if you want you can <laughs> yeah um but um so um 
photography for me started like really as a hobby um, after when I quit school and um, when I finished school, not quit. <laughs> yep. And um, and uh, so yeah, I I really like to to bring it when I was skiing or just hiking in the mountains. But then when I started working um, full time, um, like I, I did I did many jobs, but yeah, like the last one, I was pretty much uh, uh, with really committed. Like you know, when you try to to compete in a World Cup and work full time, it's difficult to find time to go also <laughs> taking pictures. So, uh, but it's still something that I I I did when I was in holidays or yeah, on free time. And then I got this opportunity with Salomon, which was really, really fortunate. <laughs> um, in 2015, I started to like, um, just uh, because uh, I went to the Salomon Running Academy, the, the, the guy, the ones from, for the kids, um, the young guns, um, all the young guns that now are superstars in yeah. the trail. And uh, I was there as a guest, as I was part of the Salomon um, Italian team, let's say. Uh, I was an, an ambassador for Italy. And I was living close to Limone, uh, where took place the event. And so I was there and I, I got to meet all the legend in Salomon, like Greg Volet and Serge, the designer. And so I, I was there as the others and you know I had to fill the questionnaire um even though I was like 10 years older than them <laughs> <laughs> you know yeah and, and I actually was lucky because I was supposed to be doing um the Medalama one of the most popular schema races but uh, there was bad weather and so it got delayed and I was mm -hmm. able to join the event and yeah yeah, then after the event, uh, after talking a bit with Greg, Greg about dreams and plans and so on, um, I, I told him uh, I was passionate about photography. I was taking some pictures when we were there. And um, like 10 days after that, um, I got a message in, on Facebook from Greg saying, hey, uh, you know, next month we are going to we're going to have a um, trail running trip to in Asia um, to develop the sports there. And we need someone who's able to run and create content on on the runs and on the on the evenings at the events. Yeah. And, and it's like, ah, and it's going to be two weeks in China and Korea. We're going to pay pay you to do the job uh, and uh, you just need to come we cover the expenses and I remember I was just like uh, on bed like watching this like reading this message and I was like okay so I was like really frozen for a second I was like okay this is this is something I have to decide now what to do because I was I was working in a shop uh -huh. And I knew, I knew I could not, because it was May and I know it, it's like busy season there. And I knew I could not ask, you know, two weeks uh, holidays. And I was like, okay, now I need to decide um, quickly. Also because it's like, okay, I, if I go, I need to start to plan everything right away because I need a visa and maybe I quit my job and I don't even get the visa and I don't get to go <laughs> to China yeah. and Korea. And also it was like, you know, I had to bet on something. I, I didn't know, you know, if it was bringing me somewhere. Yeah. He didn't told me like, you know, we are giving you a job it was like okay you have the job for these two weeks and that's it yeah and so I had I really I was like okay you know I go I I do it I quit my job in three days wow. I apply the same day for the visa for China and I was like fine yeah. <laughs> I'm doing it I, if if it's not going right, then I will find another job. It's okay, but I need to take this opportunity. I don't have to miss it. And I'm always like, wow. Sometimes you need to really be able to to get 
uh, on the boat because uh, otherwise it's leaving, you know, yes. and there's no second chance to get the boat. Yeah. And so I thought, okay, I go and I was so stressed for like the next 20 days, 25 days, because uh, the visa was not coming, you know, and yeah. I was like, oh no, now I don't even get the visa. And it came like two days before departure. Yeah. And it was like, and then, and then it started like this. And then since 15, so since this, uh, that I'm working that I've been working uh, as a freelance, but um, yeah. for Salomon mainly. And um, yeah, it's yeah, I mean, it's really wow. a great journey. Yeah, what a great story. And I uh, yes. love the way that you described it of having to take a big risk and bet on yeah. yourself and your passion for photography at the time. And it seems like that big decision has led to a fantastic career as a creative in the sport. And you're I'm one of the most, you know, sought after photographers in all likelihood. You're certainly one of my favorite follows on Instagram. You're always sharing Thank you. photographs of what you're doing. Maybe talk about the vision of from Solomon in bringing you on board in that capacity, because I think it's quite smart for them to use their athletes in multiple different ways, because now you've sort of built your career with them as both an athlete and as a creative. So maybe if there's anything you want to share about representing a brand, both in the traditional sense as an athlete, but then also kind of using your intellectual skills, your creative skills to contribute in a unique way as well. Yeah, well, uh, I really, I think I really have to thank, uh, thank Greg for, who made me start uh, like this, me and Philip, I think we were the pioneers, you know, yeah. we both started that year. He he was in the team from, from before, he this started like Philip five years Reiter. sooner. It's Philip the, Reiter, yeah, yeah German, the German, German machine. Yeah. <laughs> But also yes. a great athlete and a great photographer and creative yes. in the sport. And and yes. I think it is, I don't know, just kind of a visionary move by Greg and Solomon as a whole to recognize that you yes. guys have these skills outside of being great athletes. And yeah, I mean, I think put them to work. Yeah, the point from Greg was like, yeah, we we want to inspire people, but um we are missing so much we are not sharing enough because we we are doing such great runs and we are sharing so much uh with our team that it's a shame that uh, you just stop for photo shooting you know that he wanted to have a more of a inside view uh in team and um and it was really it was really great because at the beginning really there were not many doing what we were doing now you see more of it um but uh yeah it has it has been amazing because uh, it was like it, and it gave a possibility to me and Philip that for us it was really a hobby we were not professional photographers we did not study as photographers but you know that was a place for us because it was like okay I don't know how to take uh um a portrait of someone at the beginning you know i didn't know how to do certain kind of picture but i knew how to run hold my camera and then <laughs> take yeah. the moment and and cover somehow um a long run with the team and um and also you were sharing uh, you were not just there to to make this memory but you were there to live to live it too and so I think uh, it it was uh, it's what came out and what was like the the winning um, strategy, uh, especially at the beginning for Solomon, you know, yeah. in the past years. Yeah, They're really smart, and it's great to see how you and Philip have both kind of blossomed into these fantastic photographers and. Uh, again, he's also one of my favorite follows on the yeah. internet on Instagram. And you guys do a great job of documenting a lot of the races and getting a lot of those candid 
pictures of the Solomon athletes when they're competing. And I think because you guys are both athletes, it not only gives you better access so that you can be on Hopper Oak and Ridge or whatever at Tromso, mm -hmm. you know, have the fitness and capability to navigate that type of terrain and get those photos, but also that you have the credibility with the athletes. They probably feel comfortable around you and with you taking photographs of them. And I think it really comes through in your creative work. You talked a little bit earlier about how you've always been kind of artistic and it makes me want to talk also about your chain <laughs> inside project. And for our listening audience, they've probably seen, especially the hats that you've made. Yeah. They may not know the brand and stuff. So I'd love for you to tell the origin story of how that came about. Yeah. Yeah. That's also an, a, a nice story. I think it all is, it also came um, a bit thanks to Greg, I would say, because he was always wearing this cycling cap, caps uh, from uh, Cinelli, which is a popular Italian brand for cycling. And uh, we were in one of these trips uh, to China, and we were on this never-ending uh, train um, transfers. <laughs> and uh, it was at uh, that time, it was just like, uh, two uh, two other athletes, maybe a Japanese athlete, me, Greg, and um, Arno, the physio, and um, and uh, um, actually it comes a bit before because at the um, advance week, you know, the the team team meeting yep. we do every year for Salomon. Uh, that year we do we did it in uh, Keswick in the Lake District in in England, uh -huh. and. Um, and uh, Greg brought these white, like blank uh, caps, cycling caps, branded Salomon, and he brought pencils to draw on them. Oh. And, uh, and it was it was funny because you know everyone started to draw uh, on their caps, you know, and uh, and basically there was me and Ricky Gates really into it. And the other were just like doing, doing random things. But, um, and uh, in one of the, after that, um, uh, he, he was still traveling with some of these caps. And uh, during one of these transfers, um, I was really bored. And uh, Greg gave me one of these caps and I started to design something. And, uh, and uh, while well, I drew um, a mountain goat, on top of a mountain yeah for him and he used this this cap until it was like really horrible to look because it was like all the <laughs> ink was coming down you know it was yeah. not really waterproof but he, he loved it because he loved the design and then uh, Arno came to me he's like ah yeah you know but uh, you are really passionate about what um about and you're really good at doing this thing why you should uh, you should start to do um to make create a brand you know yeah. make some product and people will love it and then from that idea it really i really started to draw and um and uh, with the help of arno uh we started this company called insane inside design which this name it was actually coming i was thinking about this like many years before because uh, i always had this kind of um i wanted to create some kind of a brand even when i was more a bit uh, ski uh, skiing more uh, mm -hmm. a bit of a lifestyle brand and so i already had the, the logo and the name and so i was like okay well if we if we do this i think I already worked at this logo and I thought about the philosophy of being insane inside and why not using this and um, yeah we both agreed and uh, and yeah I started to do, to create these cycling caps and then uh, now we have uh, also different kind of uh, styles and some t-shirts it's still a really small um yeah brand and and of course we struggled a lot we basically stopped to work during covid and yeah. so right now it's it's restarting again so it uh, can be difficult sometimes but um yeah it's really you know it's really um for of course it's it's um it's 
are my ideas. And so when I see people wearing it and they are actually enjoying the design and they are giving compliments to me, it's it's really cool because you you know as soon as you you might like something, but then when someone else you get to the, the um, um approval and you know when people likes what you're doing and that they tell you that it's it's really particular and unique um it's really special because you know now you can find really anything yeah. online and so you really need to have something a bit special to to make it work yeah yes so before we start talking about your athletic career too and the things that you've been up to this summer maybe last maybe. question on this subject you know, I think maybe two things. If you wanted to talk about the process of creating the physical products and how it's similar or different to photography, like what is the different creative inspiration with digital images versus visual art and physical product design? But also maybe in answering that question, I just feel like you've done such a great job of establishing a really interesting career for yourself as a photographer, as this brand builder with Insane Inside, even if it is a small kind of creative artistic project right now, it's like an entrepreneurial venture. And then in addition, being an athlete yourself, any uh, advice that you would have for younger athletes coming up who are looking to make a name for themselves or make a career for themselves in the sport of trail running or in the outdoor industry? You really need to be open-minded and uh, to like um, develop different skills let's say of course there will there will always be a prevalent one you know you will always be more focused into running or more focused into work or or into design but um, there's a link between the three you know between these three word three words I always go to the mountains because I train or because anyway, I enjoy being in the mountains. Being in the mountains, like it's natural for me to look around as like, well, you know, I run and I say, oh man, that's, it's a, there's an awesome ridge. That moment, I like it to translate into art because then it's like, okay, why not bringing like, bring this awesome sunset into a hat and then um, squeeze in some quotes from the run or something that will cheer some somebody up because you know even though sometimes i i don't need to be cheered or you know everyone is personal like depends on your personality sometimes someone needs to be kicked out of the door some someone is really motivated but I think people like to be cheered on anyway. And um, so for me, it's it's really natural. Sometimes it's difficult to train hard because, I, you know, if I train uh, early in the morning and there's a beautiful sunrise, well, it's more often the opposite. I, I don't really like to wake up so early. <laughs> Let's say it. <laughs> your, mom, your mom's out there crushing mountains. Yes, exactly. Or with like, if I was like... My mom, it would have been a problem because I would have like 500 gigabyte of pictures because then I would like, I would stop and like, oh, wow, this is amazing. I need to take a picture. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah. yeah. And, uh, but I think it's also really important to have different focus, you know, mm -hmm. es especially, you know, when you have seatbacks like right now, you know, Everyone is sending me like advices on uh, Netflix uh, uh, series to watch, books, and and uh, but honestly, I have a lot of things to do at home because even though if I even if I'm not going out of the mountains, I have other things, and I don't, and I know that the mountains will be there. Yeah, you know, I'm missing something at the moment, but there's also an opportunity to do something else, which I was lacking because this summer I I haven't been working so much and and have, I haven't been drawing so much because I was more focused into running, into training. And so anyway, um, the thing I, I would like to say to young athletes is really like, um, yeah, training, 
is important if you want to develop uh, as an athlete, but remember that uh, um, we are not machine. Mm -hmm. So if you want to be a successful athlete, I think you really need to take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. And taking care of yourself, it means also um, invest in something else. Always have a, a plan B. We haven't even gotten to your athletic life yet. So we <laughs> should spend the rest of our time talking about that. I want to first talk, I just want to like talk about your summer. So you did a personal project, a sort yeah. of solo Giro d'Italia. So that I was yeah. av avidly following on your Instagram account. So explain this adventure quickly before we move on to TDS. So how did that inspiration strike you? And what was the project? Oh, so yeah, there was a, there was something in the past three years. I've been discovering uh, the like site. I've been discovering cycling, and I, I found it a, a really nice way to train. But uh, what I love the most about cycling is that you can travel far and you can see so much uh, without hurting your body too much. <laughs> because with running, you know that it can be really painful sometimes. <laughs> Um, so yeah, last year I was really, really following and I was, uh, I got, I, I, I became a huge fan of, uh, Lachlan Morton. Of course, he's a pro cyclist, so he does that more than me. <laughs> and so he, he did a, this Altour, which was, um, through the France by himself, uh, unsupported. And uh, also he covered the transfers of the Tour de France. So this was insane. Yeah. It, during the Tour de France and with the set in the same time. So he actually finished a few days um, before that. But yeah. Yeah. So this was like, I was super inspired. And, you know, even though, I mean, this was a, a huge adventure uh, that he said was the hardest thing he had ever done. Um, but it still it like it got in my head and I was like, okay, maybe next year I want to do something like this. I took the flight down to Sicily and of course I didn't do the first three stages in Hungary because I mean, it was a Giro d'Italia for me. I didn't sure. have to go there <laughs> and you know, I had to move myself. So the first three days I was mainly riding the transfers and then I thought, Okay, I'm gonna die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I was like, okay, because you know, I I did ten hours the first day, ten hours the second day, and then I was like, uh, okay, then I had to, to to do the transfer, and it started to be insane because you yeah. know I was still riding quite fast, but it was a lot to manage and. As I told you, I had 600 kilometers yeah. of riding before to start, which yeah. is like nothing. Not enough training. Yeah. <laughs> no. But you did it. I mean, what an adventure. Um, so basically, yeah. you know, just to summarize for the listeners, you you rode the entire Giro d'Italia, which is a three-week heroic bike effort. Yeah that many of the top professional athletes and professional <laughs> cycling teams in the sport do, but you did it all by yourself without a support team. Yeah, <laughs> yeah with my bags, my bags on the bike and uh, covering my transfer somehow, yeah. trains and yeah. lift uh, and uh, parents when possible. <laughs> and it was super cool. And at the end, there was still like um, 3,000 150 kilometers mm -hmm. and 50,000 meters of elevation gain. Oh my god, in gosh. 18 days! <laughs> well, it was uh quite yeah. a thing to follow on your Instagram, and I would encourage yeah. people to go back and check out some of the photos. Yeah, there's posted. still some stories. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's fantastic. And I think, yeah, again, just another good example of your creativity and i love that you took the inspiration from lachlan morton who had done something similar in the tour de france the yeah. year before so let's talk about tds where you 
accomplished a fantastic victory, probably in large part because of the fitness that you gained in this three week bike tour that you did all by yourself <laughs> through Italy. Um, talk about the, the race itself. Like how, how did it play out for you? I know it was the longest race that you'd ever done. And I know yeah. you were really happy with your performance. So what did you learn at TDS? Yeah, that was, um, yeah, that was, uh, something special. Um, I really love this race. Um, I've been working on it. At the, I've been working at the race many years, and um, and then I, so I was sure that was the the races I liked the most uh, in the UTMB week. Yeah, because it's a little bit more it's more wild, more technical. It's really hard, and it's it really suits me more than the other races. And I mean, I felt well. I I felt good in training, and um, not every day, of course, because even in the best season, you have the the shittiest days. Uh, but you know, overall, I was uh, getting um, to the start line more confident and definitely feeling more prepared than the previous year. This year, I did the best I could to prepare, and I think I I prepared well. Um. Anyway, yeah, it's still it was still like something, you know, it's going into the unknown because I never been um out so far, uh, so long, you know, uh, while running. I did the 24 hours skiing, but it's completely different. And so I found myself uh, leading the race really pretty early from the first checkpoint. Um and uh, what I think played uh, really well this year, it's uh, the different time of the start um, because we started at midnight mm -hmm. and I really love to start at midnight also because, like to start in the dark. Yeah. Um, because it gives you uh, some peace, you know, you just, yeah. you can, you can just focus on yourself. You, you can listen to music or anyway, just, you just, you don't see peace people you don't see who's behind you who's in yeah. front of you you just see headlamps and so you can't really you can't really stress oh someone is right behind me don't know and so you just do your own thing uh which is pretty cool i think yeah. even if if i'm i'm not someone who would stress too, too much if someone else is in front or so on it's still like it gives you it's a peaceful start let's say yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I'd love to hear you talk about what it meant for you in your career. I mean, winning a race during UTMB re week is obviously a career highlight for any athlete. It's like winning a stage of the Tour de France or something like that. And again, it being your longest race ever, I'm sure this was one of the most special competitive achievements in your career. Have you had time to reflect on that? Yes. Well, for sure, this this was a uh, huge for me and. I can still like remember the feelings and like the pain also. <laughs> I was I was like ex uh, yeah experiencing uh, the last part and but it's the same thing for everyone maybe yeah. not for Courtney I don't know but <laughs> the, <laughs> she's coming back on the podcast to talk about the grand race so yeah I'll ask yeah her. yeah I'll ask yeah her I'm just keep on I'm just keep on looking at how she go down in like, uh, at the Grand ride, I'm like, come on, like, yeah. fake it, like, try to limp <laughs> sometimes, so then we feel like better, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, she's incredible. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, it's it's interesting because you know, um, yeah, this summer was a bit like, um. So it was like the reaction. It was funny because I always knew that. I was able to to be competitive and I've been competitive other years. It's just that um I was always um working I was working more and so you of course the training can't be perfect if you are working a lot in yeah. between and uh, of course you need to to adapt your plans to the work. So for me it was mainly I'm working at races and then when I can I try to race because I like to be fit and I like to race. And this year was a little bit the opposite. I was like, okay, I want to have this focus 
and then I will work. But if somehow this will impact too much my training, I will try to reschedule the thing. So I was just moving things around. And this was the first time I was doing this. Um, but still, also previous year, I was able to, to do some good races. I finished fifth at Kima, second at the Marathon du Mont Blanc, the 90K. Yeah. I won the Ultra Dolomites. Uh, uh, but still, it, it's funny because it was like, it's like I win out of nowhere <laughs> this, yeah. this summer. It's like, ah, but I, I didn't know you, you, you were so strong or you were running. I was like, I, Yes, I, I, it's not coming like yeah. not that I started training in May and and this is what the result. I mean, it's it's many years that I'm training. Maybe uh, for sure, it's like um, it's three years that now I had really like um, consistent training uh, through s- summer and winter, which has gave me better fitness this yeah. year. But mm-hmm. it's funny because I, I've always been competitive, maybe some, maybe more in schema than in trail running, depending like the years. Yeah. But I've always been competing, but uh, especially for trail, it was like something like, ah, oh, but I didn't know you were actually a runner. Or like, yeah. Yeah, just like not running to take pictures and racing sometimes but actually being competitive yeah and winning um, pds yeah <laughs> now, now everybody knows yeah. well congratulations i mean what an awesome accomplishment you. for you and what a great place to build from for the future once you get this little injury behind you so yeah. obviously another thing that we need to talk about and we'll sort of start winding down now but after tds the good feelings didn't last all that long i mean <laughs> Obviously, you were celebrating your victory, but then there was a bit of a, I don't know if you could call it a miscommunication. Maybe that's generous, but I'll let you explain. Yeah, that's generous. There was a... uh, there was a little bit of a controversy relating to the prize money yeah. and the lack of prize money for TDS. So explain to the listeners what happened there. Yeah, so prize money and UTMB has always been a really um difficult topic to understand there's always some kind of mystery around there's no you know in any other races there's a there's a website and you go on prices and then there's a clear you know it's clear first first get this the second get this and it's everything pretty much detailed and and clear for utmb has never been like this and has always been kind of like kind of a surprise for the runners. Sometimes there was no prize money. Like years back, there was no prize money. Then there was some prize money. And then this year, uh, as it started to be, um, as this like series, UTMB series started, there was the promise that the prize money would have raised. Mm-hmm. But so the rules uh, in the website, they still stayed the same. I mean, it was written like last year that the prize money uh, was given to all the races, basically. So, or all the four main races, at least, TDS, CCC, UTMB, and OCC. So TDS was in it. <laughs> yeah. So, well, after after the, the prize ceremony um, in Chamonix, uh, we didn't get any envelope, nothing, no mail, nothing. And so um, we were wondering, but we were also joking about uh, saying, okay, even this year we don't get anything from, from UTMB, you know? Yeah. Um, and then um, all of a sudden, you know, as I'm someone who's working also behind the scene, I got in my content team group uh, uh Jordi was telling me hey you know that uh, Manuel Maria's got 10,000 euro for for the OCC yeah. and I was like oh okay yeah uh, wow okay that's a price money and so yeah I started to investigate with the other runners and uh, so basically I find out that uh, TDS was the only race um like the runner of TDS did not receive any mail 
so I kindly uh, connected with the um, organizers and asking if uh, we were going to get something, if there was a mistake or so on. Uh, I just asked a question. And uh, I got uh, an answer like after a week, basically, uh, saying congratulations for your TDS. But uh, uh, no, there's no price money for th There was not the uh, plan the price money for TDS this year. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> like this. Uh, ah, and so I was like, okay. Uh, I asked um, if I could, like, if she could tell me why. You know, just like because in the in the rules it's written that TDS was supposed to be paid, mm -hmm. and I got no no answer. Um, so um, so then well, you posted on Instagram and started a big yeah. I started. I, I you know it took it took me a few days to to like uh, get angry, yeah. you know, and just thinking like how what can I do. And then I think I wrote it down, you know, with the right tone, because I think, you know, not shouting at them, but, you know, just uh, uh, it's good that other people realize that such a race, in, like even with, in a, in, with such a race like this, you can get no price money. Which yeah. is ridiculous, you know, yeah. because if you if you know like all the UTMB business and everything, it's ridiculous, and no one would ever imagine that there's no price money for a race like that. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, okay, even though even if I don't get money, I need to bring up the problem because if 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 everyone just like say, okay, well, uh, bad luck, I should have picked another race. You know, this will never change. At least next year, you know, they will write it in the rules. No price money for TDS. And then you would pick another race if you yeah. just want to run, if you want to have a price money. And uh, but I got a really good um, um, response from uh, the the audience, you know, from the people who was people was getting angry like like it was me you know and uh, yeah. and um they were supporting me and uh, and i think uh, this was really good because um you know if it's if you want to get if you want to create an environment that's working well for the athletes for the spectators and everything you need to bring up the problems because you know you can't hide the problems and you, yeah. you can't just highlights what's uh the best what's like you know because it's like yeah i got visibility i got followers whatever but you know this is still something this was a big mistake at yeah. least at least you can't pay your bills in communication with, because yeah, if, you can't pay your yeah, bills with yeah. new followers and with good media attention yeah exactly and at, at a you certain know, point the professional athletes do need to be compensated for the performances that they contribute yeah. to the sport and you articulated it very well and very civilly and ultimately UTMB responded in the right way didn't they can you explain yes. what happened once you sort of made yeah, your after yeah after a day of uh, insanity because <laughs> everyone uh, was tagging UTMB and so they were bringing on the attention um they just said that they were gonna they were gonna give a prize money so the price money after was something a bit ridiculous, let's say, but I would say, okay, it's better than nothing. And this is not, this did not surprise me because also I know the, <laughs> the organization, how it is. And if they originally decided they were not giving price money to TDS, then they just wanted to shut up the um, the critics and, yeah. and so on. So me and uh, Ludwig Pumere, uh, which was the main uh, main lead, uh, main uh, winner, uh, we got one thousand three hundred euro, which compared to ten thousand uh, for the <laughs> other races, it's for a much yeah for a much longer harder race. Ridiculous, but we cover some yeah. 
yeah. we cover somehow, you know, at least the travels. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. again, I think this is going to be an important conversation to keep at the forefront of the sport for years to come. And, you know, I'm sure UTMB learned a valuable lesson from this episode. And now they at least yeah. will be more clear about what the prize money distribution is. And if TDS really isn't going to be part of their kind of world series, quote unquote, or the yeah. world finals, then who knows, maybe it's better for them to just stop doing the race, which would be a shame, like you said, because, you know, I've done the race myself and I think it's a fantastic event with a fantastic, beautiful course. Yes. And uh, I think it deserves to be part of UTMB week, um, but they'll have to do a better job of actually defining what its role is in UTMB week and especially defining the parameters of the prize money distribution for the pro athletes so that they can know going into it, what they can expect based on their performances. But, um, Martina, yeah. you know, we've been going now for almost an hour and a half and, uh, you know, I, yeah. I, uh, I'll let you go, but it's been a really, really fun conversation. And again, I think, uh, you really exemplify the 21st century professional athlete and being able to incorporate your creative skills and your talents into your career and, uh, you know, creating, you know, a great following for yourself, a great brand for yourself and delivering a lot of great value to your followers and your sponsors. It's, uh, it's been a long time coming to come on the podcast and I appreciate you spending some time with me. Thank you.